thank you again. Um, we're up to maybe our seventh or eighth talk this afternoon. Um, this one with Luke Toyman, who uh, is a painter um, based in Antwerp, Belgium, um, who, as far as I know, has been making paintings since the mid '80s. Um, but your paintings are quite well known. But I really wanted to—I was really curious about these films that you made uh, before you made paintings. I mean, yeah. have they been shown and, and what are they? Or what were they? Yeah, first of all, uh, of course I've been painting before the 80s. Yeah, sure. I think the first oil painting I made, which is now actually in the museum in Osaka, was when I was 16. Oh, wow. And uh, why did I stop uh, or painting? I stopped at, at a certain point because yeah. it became too existential, too suffocating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that point, a friend of mine just accidentally shoved a super 8 millimeter camera in my hands and I started to film like a diary every day. From there, uh, I went to Super 16 and the end, I w really wanted to make a film, like a movie in 35, yep. which of course financially did not work out. Uh, these films have never been shown as such as a product or an end product because they are not. They're just a process. And it was a process that actually in allowed me to distance myself from the imagery, whereas I could con continue to paint. Mm -hmm. So in fact, you will see also if you look in a book or even the, like the, the thing that came out with my retrospective in the States, you can see like between the last painting of the, the end of the 70s or the eight, beginning of the 80s, and you see a painting like La Correspondance from 85, you see a huge difference. Yep. How would you characterize that difference? I mean, yeah, first of all, that it's more detached and it gave me the distance that I needed to, for example, make a series like the Diagnostical View, which I maybe wanted to make in 78, but didn't have the distance to make. Mm, yeah. Then you have the element of cropping. Then you have the element of editing. You have the idea of a close-up, which are all things that don't exist in real life, but do in film. Yep. Um, so and, and another thing which is quite interesting maybe to, to note is that I'm part of a, a television generation. So that means there is a sort of manco of experience and an overload of, or overkill of imagery. And so there is also the element of the pause. You know, you can pause an image, basically. I was going to ask you about the um, kind of milieu, like in the late 70s, uh, when you were, you know, first making paintings, like, you know, were, were, your, were your friends and colleagues all painters? Were people branching out into photography? I mean, what were the kind of mediums and yeah, what was the mood at the moment? Well, painting was not really, uh, yeah, I'll just say that most of the people changed at that point from b making paintings, going to installations, video came up. Uh, and those were, also painting was not really uh, something that was, it was looked upon a little bit as an antique, so to speak. Yeah, uh, were you, uh, that claim of being reactionary? Did you get a lot of? Did you feel? Uh, yeah, sure. But but my 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 answer to anybody and still to this very day is why do you still paint? Is that uh, is very simple. That's because I'm not naive. <laughs> Painting is the first conceptual image ever made. May it yeah. be in a cave for people who are like initiated to see how they have to hunt. So, and it has always been uh, on the side of the powers to be, of course, it's, but it's never been naive, it's always been art. So that's really important to know. And it's the first conceptual image. And actually, every artist, most of the artists start with painting, they will not continue. And also, I think it's quite idiotic to have this st stupid discussion about is painting dead or alive. It's a hollow uh, disc uh, discourse, and it's a discourse that's mutually uh, misunderstood on a theoretical level by people and critics. And also the same goes for painting and photography, which might have been an issue for people like Richter and V.S. Selmans, but not anymore for my generation, because the toolbox has become much more bigger. You have websites from which you can play, you can, uh, through computer alterations, alter an image before you make it paintable. Uh, I've made maquettes, I've worked with Polaroids, taken from those maquettes, drawing. So it's all part of the toolbox in order to come to a painting. Uh, that was something I wanted to ask you about, was really the evolution of... I mean, is there has the internet inter impacted your production of images? I mean, it's certainly it's a, a, a new source, like a new place to look for I images, and it's certainly much easier in a way to find images now than maybe it was pre-internet. But has it changed the way you make, m make things? Uh, 
you mean, you mean physically make things? Yeah, physically or or even like the kind of images. I, ju I just still paint with the same uh, study paint I painted when I started out. Uh, but I mean, what what has changed, of course, is that of course you can't. Th there's no no need in fighting the new media. You have to take them as I say, as part of the toolbox. Yeah. And this opens up other realms of the visual, or visual, let's say, like, I made a whole uh, group of paintings, which uh, this group was called Against the Day. And it was based upon virtual imagery. It was based upon uh, <coughs> yeah, Big Brother. It was based upon elements within the now. But yeah. since there's such a multitude of imagery, not all the images are... Uh, paintable, so it's very, very yeah. precise for me, and that's what it takes a long time for me to pick the images and prepare them. That takes months, and once they are pinpointed, they will be painted one after the other at a certain given moment uh, in a in a day in the week. Okay. Mostly, it's, it's it's on Thursday. All the paintings are, are painted in one go, yep. even when it's six meters, whatever. If it's yep. it can be a long day, fourteen hours, whatever. I was going to ask you about that because um, the, the preparation for your work, I mean, you, you started to go into this. So there's a period of, of research um, where you're gathering images, uh, but do you generally imagine making a body of work and conceiving of it and then executing it? Or are you also gathering images as you go along? And, you know, kind of where do series come together and where do they end? And well, I give you a, a very specific uh, sure. example because that will make yeah, it clear. Yeah, Otherwise, it becomes a bit too abstract. So one, once I was in preparation of the show proper, which was like uh, 2005, and the word proper sort of like incites the idea of improper. And this was, of course, after 9-11. And this was also when the Bush legislation was still there. So you could feel the stability had, that became nearly physical, so to speak. And I wanted to make something about it. So my first idea was Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, ballroom dancing. Now, with my wife, I'm browsing on the web, and by accident, I find an image of the governor's ball in Texas in 2005 with exactly what I needed, a woman swinging her head back, a guy in a tuxedo, a, 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 an evening gown on the seal of Texas. Yep. And that yep. was one. One image was there. The second image came about in a bar at night, uh, quite a marginal bar because I don't, then I'm not detected. And I'm reading the newspaper and one of my friends, still a friend, used to be the former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Karel de Gucht. And he made quite a sexist remark because Condoleezza Rice came to my country and he actually said she is uh, quite intelligent and not unpretty. And that's where I had it, ballroom dancing, Condi Rice, yep. going for the aberration within the legislation and also with the irony of the fact that, of course, she was right in the pick of the, the choice of the party because the Republicans have abolished slavery, the Democratic Party did not. Also the fact that you wouldn't know what it would add up to. From there, I went to an old book that I still had with about the perfect table setting and the perfect American housewife because, of course, Condoleezza Rice is quite uh, contained. And so, in that sense, shows come together. Gotcha. And where do they stop? I mean, you, just when you you think in terms of shows, like, well, it, or I, I think every image in itself should be valid. I mean, yep. uh, it's just that I always, from the the very first show, the gallery show, of course not. That was a selection out of hundred and hundred and fifty works. Uh, but from the second show on, I made a point that although every work has to be in itself valid and should, I mean, should take on the viewer. All the other images should work in a sense together, when it's, especially when it's the first showing, which is a gallery, sh which is a gallery show mostly. Yeah. You should have this sort of vacuum also, in a sense. Later on, they will be scrambled in museum shows, and s most of those museum shows I did about uh, I did 102 solo shows. I built up my own shows. And it was only uh, up until the tour in the States that the two curators, Madeline Greenstein and... Uh, <coughs> Helen Mooswood, I allowed them to work in a chronological way. Because they, at certain places, sort of like recouped entire bodies of work in three different stages within that uh, sort of like yeah, linear way of, of putting up a show. And to go back to another thing you were saying, that most of the paintings are made on Thursdays. Um, <laughs> but uh, wh why the constraint of one day? I mean, well, because I, I only have that much of an attention span. Okay. <laughs> and uh, it's important to say that for me, painting yeah. is not something extraordinary. Yep. 
but it is quite intense. And yes. intensity is important, and for me, two elements are really important to paint, and that is timing and precision. And once you lose that, it's like people trying to create a style. When you stylize your style, you're gone. You lost it. It has to be your handwriting. It has never be premeditated in such a way or stylized in a way that it becomes a craft or whatever. No, it has to have this sort of emergency and urgency. In, in that way, um, you know, on like a, a Wednesday, um, are you already thinking about painting on Thursday? And like, is there like a performative... Not oh, yeah, in the sense yeah, of having yeah, an audience, yeah, but like you the, prepare yourself. The nervousness is building itself up, and till this very day, yeah. I'm still exceedingly nervous before I start. Yeah. Starting is the most horrible thing to do, and also I don't paint on a white canvas because mm. the white that I paint first is a sort of shade of white, and then I make the drawing, yep. and that's how I find the size, and then the painting starts. And the first three hours are hell because I know what I'm doing, but I can't see it because the contrast comes in later. And so then, and only then, things fall together, and then the pleasure starts when it when it works out, of course. And you paint wet into wet. Yeah. Um, do you have you always used the same oil paint? Are you? Yeah, uh, it's, I, I used to work with blocks, but they took that away, and then yeah. it was Rembrandt, which is actually very stupid paint. I tried to work with good paint, Winsor & Newton, but that's too much color for me in one blow. <laughs> and also, there's a lot of line oil in it, so I don't have to put line oil in it. I just have the turpentine and, and make it thin and work like that. So, yeah. it's, it's for me, it's like the same with watercolor. It's Talons, it's not Winsor & Newton. I can't work with it. It's too good. And uh, what are the other uh, studio conditions like? Uh, do you listen to music? Um, no, no, never. never. No, I've, never I've never bought a record in my life. Really? The women that live with me do that, and I've been a bouncer for a living, so <laughs> I heard some music at the doors. Yeah. But I never bought a CD. I've never put on the radio. I hardly watch television because there's nothing to see on television. So, uh, in a sense, when I work, it is quiet. Uh, do you watch movies, then? No, no, I watch a lot of movies. I'm, I'm really... Uh, With the sound still off? go to the movie theater also, make a point of it, to not only to see uh, them on DVDs, but also to see them in, in real life on a real size. I think that's important for some movies. Not to fixate on this, but uh, um, do you think of your work, even after you stopped making films, as having a kind of relationship to... I don't want to call it cinema, because mm. cinema is different than film. Yeah, like, no. I mean, yeah, does it have a relationship? Yeah, in a, in a way it does, of course, because I already pointed it out that it has yep. this element of the pause, it has yep. the element of the, of the, the close-up, uh, and there are things that are fabricated within those images, and even yep. like the one that's on the fair is directly derived from a YouTube image, yep. and that's actually the pitches that you see are the first pitches filmed in 1913 in Technicolor, that's why they have this hello, mm -hmm. and that's what I like, the element of the projection also, and, and, and that, those are things that reappear, that's also a fascination. And William S., can you just tell us about William S., the other painting? Oh, yeah, the that's, yeah, that's a funny story, because... Um, Actually, so there was this, uh, well, as I said, I go to some marginal bars, not to be recognized and to be left alone. And so there's one guy that comes up to me, which is Dutch, with a strange hairdo, and he, he apparently is a writer. And he wrote a book, which he then published on Amazon, which you can figure out. And he wanted me a picture of uh, one of my works on the cover. Eventually, it became the work... Uh, couple, which was like two canaries, actually, yep. oh, yeah. and it was on the, f the, 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 it was here in the fair last year. Yep. And so, but I said, first I want to read your book. So I read the book, and the title of the book is a uh, Japanese office horror in full swing. So what actually happened to the guy is that the guy actually went to Japan, worked there as an English teacher, got married, had a kid, and got an affair with the secretary. And once he wanted to divorce from his wife, the secretary blamed him of having raped her, and they put him in an isolation cell for three months before he came back. So he clearly held a grudge. So in a sense, he then sent it with his uh, text. He sent it a photograph, but the photograph from the 70s, where he's much younger. And then I, it was such a, an awful painting, but there was like this blue, you know, this, this, anyway, a, a, an awful era. I grew up, I grew up in it with this hairdo and all that. And actually, he came to the studio with his wife and his kid before the painting left uh, to the fair here. And he's hoping that that will also backfire on his book, of course. <laughs> it, will it happen? No, well, just <laughs> please buy the book, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, painting is a form of revenge. <laughs> 
<laughs> is it though? I mean, for you, for you, I mean, your painting, you know, tackles politics in a way, and like, and not just in a way, but like, rather matter of factly. Um, can it be a kind of revenge? Like, um, is it? Is there a way of like? Choo- the, the very specific act of choosing an image to reproduce, you know, on the scale that you do and in the manner that you do, like. Well, first of all, I had a, a conversation with a couple of uh, Chinese painters, a friend of mine, yesterday actually, about the fact that you. Uh, there was this element that when I did the Belgian Pavilion, with of course the whole serious monarchy talk of dealing with our own colonial history, that a lot of people became to perceive me as a political artist, which is impossible. An artist can never be political. I mean, if you would load up an artwork from the beginning with a political stance, then you do just make uh, propaganda or propaganda in reverse. So in a sense, an artwork can have a specific political meaning at a certain given time and moment, and that's something else. And so in that sense, I think it should always be open-ended, it should never be moralistic, and it should always have layers, layers. And the visual remains the visual is the first thing you see and for me it's just important because I make it and I work with representat- re- representation or represented imagery that I know what it is it has to have a meaning for me otherwise I cannot be incest to, to, to paint it actually just sure. so that's why yeah but revenge is not ethical oh no no, no. revenge <laughs> is always there I mean uh, I've been pestered and bullied as a kid in school and I all said I will come back at you so the anger managed by growing old grows higher and higher, which is great because you shouldn't become uh, like old and nice, you know, it's better old and nasty like Alex Katz, for example, who I know and who Peter Sheldale once said, yeah, we were friends but now he's become the sore winner (laughs) (laughs) Well, Alex Katz says nice things about your paintings too (laughs) but maybe he's, yeah become the cheerful old older painter Um, but uh, Currently, I mean, what are your interests? I mean, there was this period where, at least in the U.S., um, you kind of achieved some... Yeah, your work was talked about in terms of offering a kind of what was seen as a European critique of the Bush administration, which, you know, um, you know that kind of outsider perspective... Um, which, but at the moment, I mean, is but there the, a, the, what's the new, really angry? The new, the new show at, at yeah. David's place, David Swerner, yep. for November is finished. It's on transport. Yep. And the show is called Summer is Over. And this will be the 10th show at David's, uh, with, that I do with David Swerner, which will be celebrated with a book. And yeah. this show is about me. It's not about a team. It's about uh, actually nearly elements of abstraction and monumentality like a piece of a cracked window that I see every day on the other side of the street above the door the back side of the Antwerp Zoo is also sort of like window pane and a part of a jacket a part of my leg and a part of and then a photograph my wife took when I had glasses in, in uh, with the iPhone which is not a flattering uh, uh, image but really a great one and that's called me for example and so you s- and you will have this in the last space at the Davis Gallery, I did, then I would have done in every space a show. And all the paintings will be here, and here will be the self-portrait, which will be facing the work, which is also playing with this idiocy of the romantic positioning of the painter looking at his fucking work and shit like that. And it's called The Summer is Over. Now, The Summer is Over comes from the father of a colleague artist of mine who died Recently, he already had Alzheimer when we were in the restaurant, and he was there with his son, which is this colleague uh, artist of mine. And all of a sudden, he has a lucid moment, and he goes to me in Antwerp, and of course, he says, like, the summer is really over. And so, <laughs> two weeks later, he was gone. So, But so, um, this uh, sounds more like um, a, a like middle statement. You know, like well, at, um, at not all the shows that I make are uh, about themes. I mean, yep. they always have an exchange. You, have, you have, like the the proper show was clearly about something. The, the diagnostical view show was clearly about something. Sure. That, but then there is always another show, security that I did like in '98 in, in the States. So it's not about that. It goes. But I just mean that your summer is not over. Huh? Your summer is not over. No, no, but that that's yeah. the joke. You know, that's the joke that people are going to think, oh, uh, what the fuck is going on? So that's that's just that's all. So and then then there's then another show which is coming up uh, at next. the new place uh, that David will open up in October. That's also finished, and this well, and the bulk of the work is now in a circular building in a, a non-for-profit space in Zagreb because I come from there, where I combined it with five wall paintings downstairs, 
and that show will be called Allo with an exclamation mark. Uh, what's your yeah? Can, can you talk about that your relationship to Zagreb and then also yeah? Uh, well, uh, I have a quite a long-standing relationship with Eastern Europe and Eastern European artists, mm -hmm. and of course the problem with Zagreb was that they never have money. So the the whole project was like worked on and changed during th two three years in order to make it happen, and finally now it happened, uh, which is a rewarding element because of course you have to understand that these people live with good intentions, but a high amount of corruption, and so the money just goes to tycoons and left uh, and left and right. So it's very difficult to organize anything. So that's why I think it's important to do that. And the paintings themselves, are they? Um the paintings are actually the uh, this, which will also be the bulk. Of, I mean, as I say the most important chunk of the work in uh, in London uh, are actually uh, the Allo paintings. They're all called Allo. Allo one, two, three, four, five, six, and they're they're a filmic sequence basically. And this time is taken very literally, and it's taken from a film called the, the Moon and Sixpence, which is also a book by Somerset Morgan, which was filmed turned into a film in 1942, and George Sanders loosely plays Gauguin. And uh, this is also the first portrayal of the Hollywood portrayal of the artist as being like this sort of like self-engulging, uh, sort of mad personality, immoral, and the whole romanticism. And then again, he goes abroad. He goes to Haiti and fucks all these women and all that. And so in that sense, uh, the, this was a very, very, very like, yeah, cliché. Uh, representation, therefore interesting also. Uh, but what interests me is not the film, because the film is actually not that great. But the end uh, images of the film are actually when the doctor comes to the, the little town and the indigenous woman is crying in the sand and Gauguin is already dead. And he has this thick German accent like all the coconuts were rotting. And then he goes in the hut and then it turns all color. And this was amazing because these were all mock-up paintings of Gauguin, so like, it's like very badly done, but you see the doctor looking at him. And what you see in those paintings is the first aha ellipsis when he comes, and then you see him close up, more close up, and then you see part of the paintings, which is like horrible, and then you see part of this sort of uh, statue also, uh, that the ones that Gauguin made, the virility, about the virility and so on, that's where it then ends. It sounds great. I, I would and love to keep the talking. Good, and the interesting thing is that these paintings are extremely colorful. Oh, yeah. So, really? so, so because they have the least amount of color. Huh. I mean, that's another thing I just want to emphasize, that people uh, tend to see the paintings as bleach, but the paintings work with tonality. And in order to create yep. the right tonality or the right warmth or the right coolness or temperature within, a, within, the, within that tonality, it takes a lot of colors in order to make that. Yeah, that I, I've always wanted to ask you about the um, mix, how you mix your colors and like what uh, those on, on the spot, never with percentages, no, just like that. And so. but those shades, what what can I ask you? What paints you're using? Just for yeah? what what colors do you use? Oh, uh, uh, my Everything. palette uh, is, is it's like uh, it's like enormous. It's like it's like forty, fifty colors. I need them also, and I also put them out like the yellows there, the reds there, the blues, the violets, so that I know exactly where I'm going without even looking at it. And then, because I need all these colors in order to create this, this the density. Um, do you, have you come to think of it as, I mean, do you see a style in your work now? Or is it something that you don't have a perspective on? Yeah, people sort of recognize my work and say, sure. okay, this looks like a Timon's painting. Yeah. I mean, I've even gone so far as an art firm to talk about the Timon's effect, which is, of course, ludicrous to begin with. Because, I mean, of course, there has been an influence and an effect, but yeah. it's quite ludicrous to, in an article to take the same cut like, of an image which I would have made 10 years uh, before a Habakkos would have made. Because Habakkos paints it completely different. So people have to differentiate continuously, I think. But there is, of course, something that you could recognize, I suppose. But it's not been, uh, for me, it's not in, in terms like a style. It comes natural. Yeah. And there's also one thing in painting which is I could easily repaint like say the site or things that I made in the, the end of the 90s but I would for sure not be able to create the same intensity so you would nevertheless see it technically maybe not but you would feel it and I think uh, besides the, the, the visual there's also what you feel when you actually see an image that's really important I think uh, and so in painting you can't go back it's just impossible you can't go back I mean that's one of the things that um, I would say that I, I still admire about painters is that um, you know the there's so much um, 
it's so easy for painters to be reduced to their style that I think that actually makes it very hard to be a painter now because of that self-consciousness like um, and in a way of like whereas painting was once a kind of natural medium for people to work in and to express themselves in because now you have to choose to be a painter um, you know then you're also forced to justify the, the kind of style that you're working in and I think that I mean I'm, I think for someone who for whom it comes naturally I think that's fortunate that, which is just why I was asking you if you saw yourself as having a kind of distinctive look. Well, of but course, I mean, first of all, uh, yeah. to go back to my own history, when I started out as a painter, I started out as a painter who worked with abstraction and the gestuality and a lot of color. In order to find my meaning, I had to abolish all that element and that those aesthetics to come to a point, which was the element of reduction. And from there on, of course, I worked against my aesthetics, suppressed them and created something different. I admire a lot of artists and admire especially a lot of painters. But of course, with, and you can, of course, they will influence you, but you can never do something with art. Uh, and especially when the art is really good, when the paints are really good, they're really great. But you can only admire them. You cannot really take from them. Uh, that's also where the conviction comes from that imagination is something that is not above reality but part of the real. And so for me, reality became the starting block, not art. And I also come from a tradition in that sense because uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, in my region, Jan van Eyck used to work, which is the most, I think, important and the most per perfect. Uh, example of what painting is. It's far better than Leonardo da Vinci or whatever of the whole fucking renaissance together. So if we, if, if I start out as a painter, if we're a painter in my region starts out, we're traumatized. Because this guy was so unforgiven that if you would blow up a face like this, the size of a ball is still there. And so the element was was important with Van Eyck is that he was the first individual artist that perceived himself as an individual he had a fantastic motto, if I can, which means I'm, I have humility, but behind the humility there is a gigantic ambition. And so what he did is to open up the image and the frame of the image to the world. Think of the, uh, the wedding of the Arnold Phoenix, yep. where you have the mirror, and you also see the two p people that come out of the image. And although working under the cloak, you know, the, under the whole dogma of the, the religious world, because even science was then within that world, within the, the religious dogma, he was the first by heightening uh, the realism of the image to the disconnect from the mimetic image of Christianism. And this triggered a whole room of image building within the West, so to speak. So, of course, if you come from a country like that, I mean, so most times when there was talk about Belgium as a small, strange country, they talk about two people. René Magritte, surrealism, which is not a surrealist to begin with. Second, insert the grotesque. And they forget Van Eyck. And this was the inventor of the real. Anyway, I come out of a small country that's been overrun, but I don't know how many wars. We never had time to be romantic. We had to survive, so we were only literally totally opportunistic, also in terms of the image. And therefore, the real is, is an appalling effect in my country, a, as a cultural substance, nearly. Um, my final question will be, the, uh, what, what, are your, what are your hopes for then for that image after it leaves your studio? Uh, I hope that either when it goes to that it goes to a good institution, so a larger amount of public can see it, and when it goes to a private collection, that it goes to a passionate uh, collector who is not going to uh, put it immediately on auction, and uh, because then we have to buy it back and replace it and put it in another place because that of course becomes dangerous, and so uh, in, in that sense, and for the rest, uh, I don't really care that much. I am not a fetishist. I have not one work of myself because I can't stand it. I mean, I have exchanged work with other artists. I've bought work from other artists. And my wife is also an artist now, also tr starting up some kind of collection. So I'm pretty scared. And so the, the, the thing is that uh, I, I, I can't stand it uh, to look at it in, in, in my house. Yep. And if I go to collectors and it, I, it happens to hang in the dining room, I will put my back to it and look about other artwork and somebody else's mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Luke Thomas, thank you so much. Okay. Greatly appreciate it. <laughs>